Good afternoon. I'd like to thank those of you that have joined us today for today's webinar on the process to implement do not resuscitate orders for individuals receiving contracted services. This is um, Division Directive 3.120. Today in the studio I have with me Sherry Whelan, who is the Consumer Health and Wellness Coordinator for the Division of Developmental Disabilities. Um, before I turn that over to her, I'd like to toss out a couple reminders. If you have questions regarding um, sound or anything technical, if you'd like to drop those questions in the chat box, I will do my best to help you with those. Um, if you have questions regarding content um, with today's presentation, we ask that you put those questions in the Q&A box. We will be answering those questions live today. Those questions will be compiled and put into a Q&A document that will be distributed along with the recording of today's webinar and the presentation. As with our other webinars, you can watch um, for to become available uh, when the division email blast sent out, and you can always check out our webinar page and our previous webinar pages on the division website. So with that, I will turn it over to Sherry. Okay. Good morning, everybody, and thanks for joining us today. Um, Today I um, am going to provide you with an overview of the Division Directive 3.120, which has replaced Directive 3.080. Directive is titled uh, Process to Implement Do Not Resuscitate Orders in Individuals Receiving Contracted Services. So the objectives for today is, uh, are that I, that I hope that you'll leave this overview with a better understanding of what is a DMH non-hospital DNR order, what is an outside the hospital or OHDNR order? What is an alternative to CPR? And what is the process for implementation? Um, so we have, are going to have a lot of terms that um, sound a lot alike. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the previous directive, uh, really only new terms being introduced today will be the uh, terms referring to OH DNR or outside the hospital DNR. So hopefully that will will help. Describes the process for implementing do not resuscitate orders for individuals receiving contracted services that are licensed, certified, accredited, and or require um, through waiver service criteria that staff providing direct service be certified to administer CPR. So this shall include examples such as residential services, personal uh, assistance, debilitation, and employment services. The exception is uh, service provided through the self-directed service model. Before we do the directive overview um, and process, I'd like to uh, review a few terms that will be used um, today, and I will go into more depth on each of these terms uh, later in the presentation. So the next few slides are just going to be uh, introductions to the terms. So the term um, we will uh, review is do not resuscitate order, just as a DNR. In general, a do not resuscitate order or DNR is a legal order written to withhold pulmonary resuscitation or CPR. In cases where a person's heart has stopped or they have stopped breathing, a decapitate order or DN does not affect any treatment other than that which would require CPR. Throughout the term, terminal condition is utilized, and the revised Missouri Statute 459.010 defines a terminal condition as an incurable or irreversible condition which opinion of the attending physician is such that death will occur within a short time regardless of the application of medical procedures. The Department of Health and the Missouri Hospice defines a short time to mean six months or less. Now this doesn't mean that the person will for sure die in the next six months but it simply means that he or she has a condition that makes dying a realistic possibility in that time frame. So being introduced and to be utilized is, and utilized in this directive is uh, the outside the hospital DNR or OH DNR. As the name is, this is a do not resuscitate order that is utilized outside of the hospital 
hospital setting. The OENR regulation, 19 CSR 30-40.600, governed by the Department of Health and Senior Services and authorizes emergency medical service personnel to withhold or withdraw cardiopulmonary resuscitation from individuals in a non-hospital setting in the event of cardiac or respiratory arrest. So we'll be discussing this uh, in further detail. The DMH non-hospital DNR should be more familiar to you. A do not resuscitate order used in non-hospital settings is utilized specifically in the delivery of DMH services. A non-hospital DNR order authorizes DMH contracted service providers to withhold CPR from an individual with terminal condition in DMH contracted service in the event of cardiac and respiratory arrest. Another term that is included in this directive is a reference to alternative to CPR order. So what is an alternative to CPR order? Let's start by saying what it is not. An alternative to CPR order is not a do not resuscitate order. An alternative to CPR order is a physician's direction for the emergency action to be taken to preserve life when CPR, specifically chest compressions, are contraindicated or would do more harm than good. So now I'll introduce uh, to those terms, those key terms, let's uh, get into the overview of the Directive 3.120. The directive that the division supports an individual's rights to obtain, refuse, or discontinue life-sustaining treatment. However, individual's desires are in conflict with the department's statutory limitations, the division may have to assist the individual in locating a service setting that can fulfill their wishes. So it is very important for us to understand what those statutory limitations are. In accordance with the department's statutory mission to habilitate, treat, or rehabilitate the individuals it serves, DM contractors shall not withhold or withdraw food, hydration, antibiotics, or anti-seizure medications for the purpose of ending life, or psychotropic drugs essential to the treatment of mental illness that are otherwise authorized by law or department rule, or medication, medical procedure, or intervention that in the opinion of the medical staff is necessary to prevent the suicide of a resident or patient. And the provider contract requires that if an individual is found in cardiac arrest, the provider responds appropriately to the emergency, performs CPR or other resuscitative measures, such as the alternative to CPR, unless one of the following two conditions are in place. Either the individual has been granted a DMH non-hospital DNR authorization and obtained a DNR order while in receipt of corrected services, or the individual presents a properly executed outside the hospital DNR, or also referred to as an OHDNR, that conforms with the CR 30-40.600, uh, which is the DHSS regulation, and this um, and has proved that the individual is currently receiving hospice services. This process allows persons wanting to implement a DNR order in DMH contracted services an alternative to obtaining a DMH non-hospital DNR authorization when they meet the criteria of having both a properly executed OHDNR and is in receipt of hospice services. So this option is new to the directive. Overview, keep in mind the standard practice of um, responding to an emergency for a person on breathless or pulseless in uh, is to initiate CPR or cardiopulmonary resuscitation, which is comprised of rescue breathing and chest compressions. This standard practice is a contractual expectation for DMH contracted providers. If an individual has a medical condition that will prohibit the use of chest compressions, emergency responses need to be defined. That is what we refer to as an alternative to CPR. Alternative to CPR order, as I said before, is not a do not resuscitate order. It is an alternative emergency response. 
So if a physician determines that a current condition is such that the performance of CPR is not an option, but would cause more harm than good to that individual, an alternative plan to CPR may be developed. Um, is positioned uh, in the form of the alternative CPR order form. The staff will always respond to this emergency of persons found pulseless or breathless by calling 911 and following the physician's order for an alternative action to preserve the individual's life. An example um, of alternative action that could be prescribed may be the utilization of an automated external defibrillator or an AED. The justification and details for the alternative emergency procedure will be incorporated into the individual's plan and revised and updated at least annually or as indicated uh, with a change in status. Any necessary equipment to respond to an alternative to CPR order that's been prescribed must also be available and staff must be uh, trained accordingly. The alternative to CPR order form itself is Appendix D and is posted on the direct, uh, with the Directive 3.120 on the DMH website. So this slide is just a screenshot of the top half of that form, uh, the Alternative CPR Order Form, which is a single-page form. And um, the form must be completed, signed, and dated by the attending physician. The um, alternative form should be, uh, the order should be very clear uh, in regards to the instructions. The, given to staff for their emergency action to be taken to preserve the life when CPR is contraindicated. If you preserve, I'm sorry, if you pursue an alternative to CPR order, when um, make sure that what is written is very clear, exactly uh, the course of action to take, and if necessary, then get written clarification on that order. The um, Something new directive regarding to alternative to CPR order is is that we do need to have the renew, uh, order renewed annually, uh, and there is a, a spot on the form for that signature. The uh, we accommodate the requirement by having a second page for, to use for renewals of the original order. If a when the doctor reviews the alternative to CPR or it annually or any time when there's been a change. Uh, in their um, condition. If the original order changes, then a new form is used in lieu of just having a renewal sign. So a renewal is for um, an, an order that has not changed. The alternative CPR is reviewed um, by, by attending phys physician, as I was saying. So this is a, a physician's order and should be handled as such. The um, alternative to CPR order form should be retained uh, in the front of the individual's record for quick reference unless um, otherwise specified in the provider's policies and procedures. And of course, all staff should be knowledgeable and understand the appropriate action to take should that individual be discovered um, breathless or without a pulse. When someone is diagnosed with a terminal condition, it can be very stressful time for the individual and their families and their caregivers. And this is especially true if end-of-life planning has never been discussed. You um, will, we've already talked about the definition of terminal condition being an incurable or irreversible condition, which in the opinion of the attending physician uh, is such that death would occur within, could occur within six months or less. So it is critical that the individual's planning team discuss the diagnosis, the prognosis, individuals uh, and families' wishes. Such a significant change in status will require immediate evaluation and planning for the individual's needs now and what is anticipated to come. Um, at the discussion, the providers should evaluate their ability to meet the individual's wishes and end-of-life care, and health services and medical personnel um, are good resources to assist that team in anticipating those needs based on the individual. Um, diagnosis. <clears throat> Individuals and their families should be given the opportunity to learn about end-of-life choices, including hospice services and the options to implement DNRs in contracted services. Appendix uh, posted on the website with the directive 
it's an overview of DMH process uh, relating to DNRs and could be used to review with the individual and the family uh, or the uh, individual representative if a DNR is being discussed. Hospice care um, it focuses on a person's last six months of life when curative treatment is no longer an option. Hospice person uh, professionals work to make the patient's life as comfortable as possible. And hospice service support the individual and their family and their caregivers through uh, end of life care so they can be uh, a great uh, resource if uh, service is desired. It is important to note that when you're seeking hospice services, each hospice provider uh, may be uh, offer different resources. So in addition to the individual's existing team, if you bring in a hospice team, you, uh, that uh, team may look different in regards to the re resources that are available or needed, but hospice services can include uh, additional doctors. So there's typically a hospice um, physician, uh, nurses, home health aides, spirit counselors, social workers, pharmacists, Providers trained to offer a variety of services and other professionals such as speech uh, therapy, uh, physical therapy and occupational therapy, as well as bereavement counselors. So, more and more uh, individuals across Missouri are utilizing hospice services along with their DMH services, and you can see from the the amount of uh, optional resources that this would take additional coordination of care, and ongoing planning uh, will be required. It will be important not to duplicate services, um, and individuals may be in receipt of both DMH nursing and hospice nursing, for example, and each will have a designated role and responsibilities. Uh, this requires planning and coordination, especially between the DMH provider and the hospice provider, so uh, in an effort to not duplicate uh, services. The individual's plan should be amended to reflect changes in health and um, the plan supports provide a roadmap to achieve the individual's wishes. If a service provider that is selected is new to services uh, in the DMH setting, it may also require that additional orientation and planning be done with that, that uh, provider organization. Okay, so now um, that when an individual wishes uh, include the desire to implement a DNR within our contracted services, we have two options now. So they can either, if they were hospice, if they qualify, and a properly executed OH DNR, and submit to the department through the notification process, which we'll be talking about, or they follow the uh, previously existing process, which is to secure a DMH non-hospital DNR order. Regardless of which process the individual individual wishes to pursue, um, for all individuals in receipt of residential services, the support coordinator should always update the health inventory, um, indicate that there has been a change in that person's health and they are pursuing uh, a DNR of, of uh, either type of DNR. And so that will uh, trigger the uh, QERN at the regional office to complete uh, nursing consultation and review the individual medical status and uh, support needs. So we continue with that service. Um, um, wanted to provide you with a little bit more information about the new term that we're introducing in this directive, which is an outside the hospital DNR. Prior to 2007, a DNR, that's just the order itself, a do not resuscitate order, was primarily associated with hospital care. In Missouri, a hospital DNR is null and void outside of the hospital setting. So in 2010, Missouri implemented a new law through Department of Health and Senior Services allowing individuals outside of the hospital and ER setting to create an outside the hospital DNR. Creation of that, uh, and that's what's called the OH DNR. And creation of that OH each DNR form was intended to give individuals the choice to utilize a quickly recognizable form. It also offered some statutory uh, liability protection for healthcare professionals when honoring the wishes of an individual when presented uh, with a properly executed form. 
The OCNR form with instructions are, is available at the Emergency Medical Services Bureau Office or the Department of Health and Senior Services Office in Jefferson City, Missouri, or can be accessed online at the address that I provided to you on the screen. The code of state regulation that goes with that um, 19 CSR 30-40.600 and is also, um, the link is also provided uh, for you on the um, screen. So here is a shot of what the OHDNR form uh, looks like and it's a, a one page uh, document can be accessed online at the Department of Health and Senior Services website as we just talked about. OHDNR is sometimes referred to as the purple form. Sometimes you may have heard people say that. And it's uh, called the purple form because in accordance with the CSR, the original OHDNR uh, should be printed on a uh, purple stock to make it easily recognizable. The form itself requires the signature of the individual or their legal representative as well as their primary care physician. The physician affirms that the order uh, is ex uh, the ex wishes of the individual or the individual's representative, that it is medically appropriate and documented in the patient's uh, permanent medical record. Um, I would ask that you please refer to the DHSS regulation to get to read the, all of the requirements of how to properly execute uh, an OHDNR. I, I will provide you a few of the highlights from it. Uh, one is that an OHDNR requires the individual to be either 18 years of age or older uh, and who is not incapacitated but able to give informed consent or they, um, they have a patient representative designated as their durable power of attorney for health care or they have a guardian or limited guardian for an incapacitated person. The uh, other... Uh, um, of uh, things that are required uh, from that website, as you, you will see that, that the uh, OHDNR is only effective when the individual is not treated within the hospital. So the hospital, if they need a DNR while they're in the hospital, they get a hospital DNR. So you don't you can transport, so to speak, that in with their records. Um, the DNR shall be maintained as the first page of the individual record in the provider's care unless otherwise specified in the provider's policy and procedures. The OHDNR shall be transferred with the person um, within the community. So if they go from one provider to another provider, they can transfer for the OHDNR uh, outside the hospital. The OHDNR original uh, may be photocopied or faxed, and the photocopy of the original may be used for any purpose for which the original OHD or, uh, may be used. And then, of course, uh, an OHDNR, so out of, out of the hospital DNR, is still a DNR, and a DNR can be uh, revoked at any time. So let's focus a little bit now on the process related to how we're using the outside, um, outside of hospital DNR, which I will refer to uh, as OHDNR and the services. So for an individual that's in contracted services who's diagnosed with a terminal condition and wish to pursue hospice and OHDNR, they may qualify for this option and may not need to pursue then a DMH DNR, uh, non-hospital DNR order. Once uh, an individual pursues hospice services, um, the doctor orders the hospice services, then the individual can determine the hospice provider that they uh, feel can best meet their needs. The hospice provider of choice will then provide an evaluation and determine if the individual meets their criteria for hospice services. If they do, the individual, um, and the individual also desires to have the outside the hospital DNR, meaning they do not want to be resuscitated, they may proceed with utilizing the notification form, which we'll talk about here, but it's the DMH notification form instead of seeking the DMH non-hospital DNR. The notification form is titled Outside the Hospital DNR and the Services Notification Form. And it is a PIX A 
and is posted uh, with the DMH website, uh, the DMH directive uh, on the website as well. So um, at any point that individual, and you'll hear me say this more than once, but at any point that an individual is no longer qualifies for hospice services, um, and that can sometimes happen when someone shows a significant improvement and their evaluation, medical evaluation no longer um, feels that they will uh, potentially um, die within six months, they sometimes will no longer qualify for hospice services. So should that happen or just no longer want hospice services, then they would no longer qualify for this option um, to have the DNR. Look at um, the notification form itself. The form is three pages, but it and it's made up of four sections. Section one and two represent the primary notification process. So it's not as long and cumbersome as it may have first appear. Uh, section one of the form should be completed by the provider, the service provider, because uh, both the OHDNR and the authorized hospice services should be attached to the notification form, and then the package it should be provided to both the support coordinator and the regional office within 24 hours or uh, by close of business the next business day um, to have process. The form uh, will be processed by the regional office um, as shown in the following slides, but the provider may proceed with utilizing both the hospice services and the OHDNR without waiting on anything back from the department. The support should already have knowledge of the situation, but the notification form will serve to validate the action taken, and um, the support coordinator then will continue to monitor the individual status and support needs during uh, scheduled uh, monitoring and reviews. Section of notification form is uh, utilized by the regional office upon receipt. The, each regional office will have a, a designated staff to receive and complete Section 2 and forward that to the division director's designee, which at this time is Mary Lubert, and they will forward a copy to the DMH chief medical director's designee, which at this time is Ronette Schulte, and it be done within uh, two working days from receipt. So action serves to record um, receipts and uh, required notifications. Neither the director of DD or the medical director will be returning anything back to the um, regional office or service provider. This is a screenshot of section three, um, and the only time that this section of the form needs to be used is if the individual has or their uh, legal representative no longer wants hospice or vigil no longer qualifies for hospice services. So should that occur, the service provider should complete Section 3 of the notification form and attach a copy of the dis uh, discontinuation of the hospice services and submit both, again, to the support coordinator and the regional office within 24 hours of receipt and or the next business day. And um, change, of course, in that status would become effective immediately. Uh, communication is certainly critical to assure that the team is aware of changes in the individual's end of life planning. Uh, support coordination will follow up to assure that uh, plans reflect the individual's change in need and supports and monitor their status. Provider staff supporting individuals should also uh, make sure that um, staff supporting them are aware of the change and understand the appropriate action that should be taken should the person be discovered. Um, breathless or without a pulse. Section four is a res is just follow up or completion to when, uh, when section three is initiated. So it is completed by the regional office when that notification or if that notification would be received, and um, it is the same way by submitting to the division director designee or the and and the medical director's designee. Nothing will be re returned point out that some individuals already have an OHDNR on record, but are not terminal, and they are not in receipt of hospice services. So anyone may have an OHDNR order to present to first responders. However, when an OHDNR is used alone, without hospice, 
in a DMH contracted service. The provider would be expected to respond to the emergency initiating CPR, and once EMS arrives, the OHDNR can be presented to EMS and they can determine if it is medically appropriate to discontinue CPR. For, um, and that, and so that concludes the, the basic process for, or the newer process. But I want to review also um, the process to implement a DMH non-hospital DNR. So for individuals who have a terminal condition and they want a DNR order while in DMH services, but they don't want hospice services, uh, they wish to pursue the uh, DMH non-hospital DNR. So support coordinators um, should you know, ensure that the individual or legal representative have the necessary information about end-of-life choices and uh, the DMH DNR process, including the forms and instructions, if that's their desire. DMH non-hospital DNR process involves the use of two forms. Um, the, the statement of terminal condition, which is Appendix B, is the first form that's utilized in the process, and it, it is posted on the DMH website with the directive. And I've provided that link on your screen. This slide is a screenshot of the top half of that form uh, on page one uh, um, of the terminal condition form. This is going to be completed by uh, and signed by the individual physician providing information about the terminal condition. So remember that the terminal condition is defined as a medical diagnosis or a decline that is anticipated to end life in six months or less. So the individual or their legally responsible party must also sign indicating they wish to pursue uh, a DM, DMH non-hospital DNR and they understand that their request is subject to approval from the department's medical director. Once the signatures are secured, the form should be returned to the support coordinator who will then process uh, that through the regional office. The office QE will review the information and advise if additional clinical support documentation may be needed before submitting to the chief medical uh, director. This screenshot is just the bottom half of the same form, and this form um, and any documents is what will be uh, submitted to the chief medical director. By the, so the office is going to do this. They're going to support. They're going to submit form in the supporting documents to the chief medical director and um, that uh, medical director will either approve, deny, or request more information and returning that form to the regional office within three working days. The minister will be focusing on evidence that the individual has a terminal condition uh, indicating uh, the death is imminent within the next six months. The subordinator would be notified promptly the, um, and once the, uh, and once the, a state statement uh, of terminal condition has been signed by the DMH medical director. It does not need to be signed again for six months. Um, the request for a DMH non-hospital DNR, uh, as with a DNR, can be revoked at any time. A revocation occurs, so if a person were to revoke uh, the DMH DNR, um, a copy of that uh, revocation would be provided uh, to the regional office. In this, the medical director does not agree with the evidence of uh, terminal condition. It will be documented on the same uh, form and return to the regional office. And that decision can be appealed to the DMH medical director using uh, the instructions that are provided with 30 days. Um, once an appeal is submitted, the medical director has 10 working days to complete the uh, um, uh, speak with individual or their representative and other advocates to provide a decision. The director will notify the division of the, the, the final decision in writing. The second form in this same process is utilized once the statement of terminal condition is authorized by the medical director and then the DNR order itself and that's uh, Appendix C. Once the statement of terminal condition authorizes uh, the direct uh, authorizes to get the DNR order, it may be pursued from the attending physician uh, using this form. This is a screen DMH non hospital DNR order form, and 
uh, the DMH non-hospital DNR order must be review, uh, renewed every six months. If it still needs the DMH non-hospital DNR orders should remain in the consumer record in a prominent location and all individuals supporting uh, should understand the appropriate action to take should the individual be discovered breathless or pulseless. Please note that in the delivery of DMH services that regardless of a properly executed OHDNR or a DMH non-hospital DNR, if individual's uh, respirations and cardiac function have ceased spontaneously as a result of an accident or an other event uh, of a known terminal condition or a complication thereof, such as choking on food, the individual will not be left unattended and shall receive intervention necessary to preserve his or her life. So what this means is that the presence of a DNR order does not affect any treatment other than that which would require CPR. So you'll react and respond to the emergency. For example, you can't allow someone to choke on food without an intervention because they have a DNR in place. The present DNR does not prohibit treatment for injuries or other uh, treatments. It is just, it's just the act of performing CPR. Um, just a quick summary. That was a lot of terms and a lot of information to throw at you, but um, just highlight what we're really talking about from the previous directive to this directive is that we now have the op option to use an out-of-hospital DNR with hospice services to be able to carry out the without DMH notification, or other than, I'm sorry, without DNA, DMH authorization, just obtaining notification, uh, now are requiring that the alternative CPR be renewed at least annually. And the uh, second, that we now have a second page of the statement of terminal condition that needs to be renewed uh, every six months. So, um, I would like, I mean, this basically concludes my presentation for today, and I, I hope I'm leaving you with a better understanding of uh, DMH Directive 3.120. And um, as Heike said, that this uh, presentation recording along with the um, point uh, will be did on, on the DMH blast. So thank you.